I know that we build this conversation now that we're going to have as a conversation on the um, state of criticism and the future of criticism. And I wondered if um, um, you might want to begin, Leila, with your sense of, um, I, you spoke very, very movingly about, about the idea that of looking at the other. And I think in opposition to a quite significant trend that, um, that silos um, thinking and people in unfortunate ways. And so I wonder if we could open a little bit with you expanding a little bit on your sense of that looking outward as a critic and not necessarily framing everything within a particular personal experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I, I, when I was studying in France, I studied literature and philosophy and I was interested in Husserl. Uh, and Husserl particularly thought of knowledge as sub, you know, subject and object being separate from one another, and I always felt that uh, that it was it was cr critically important in any intellectual pursuit for the object to be different from oneself. Um, and something that I, I, an anecdote I told both Marco and Noreen yesterday when we met for the first time, uh, I said uh, a few years ago I, I wrote an essay for the New York Times Book Review, uh, uh, an essay about uh, the anti-Semitism of Mussolini. It was a fantastic book that came out in Italy, and uh, and it just outlined in Italy there's always been a great deal of silence about uh, about what happened at the time of the Holocaust, and uh, and also this this sense that Hitler came in and sort of converted Mussolini. The truth is Mussolini. There's ample evidence that he was very much not just a racist but an anti-Semite, and there are laws in effect starting in '31, very very early on, in spite of the fact that he had a Jewish mistress. Uh, Margarita Sarfati. Now, when I when that piece was published a few years ago, many people came up to me and said, "Oh, we didn't know you were an Iranian Jew," and and I found it just passing strange, you know, that there would be this assumption that because I was extremely interested in this topic uh, for various reasons, it is. A, I've always been interested in the Second World War. Uh, I've, of course, uh, Mussolini's policies are are strange, and and um, and we ought to know more. Uh, clearly what happened in Italy during those years. And, and one can be can start, for instance, by, by or, or you know, it's not because you're Italian or Jewish. Perhaps you've seen the De Sica film, the, the, the Garden of the Finzi Contini. There are many ways into interest, into culture, into these questions. But I was very, very surprised. And the question really came up. Dozens of people came up to me and said, we did not know you were Jewish, Iranian. And I just thought, I just thought wow. There is. We really have a problem in this culture that you know it is expected that we talk only about what we know. And I really made uh, an effort not to do that. And in all my journalism, I, I almost never wrote about Iranian literature. And and the next essay I wrote was about African francophone literature. And and it's difficult. And it's also and and and, and something that I'd love for you to talk about because I think you you have a great deal of experience in a, in a wide range of topics. It's uh, how does one go about choosing and how how does one go about you know whilst having a, a form of integrity and, and that that um, that criticism requires and yet not becoming you know jack of all trades master of none how how does one it's a, it's a difficult line to to toe well, and in a way one can become an expert in a subject which is not uh, native to one right but one then becomes an expert in it. I don't feel like an expert. Uh, I've had, I, I, I tend to get handed problems, uh, which I like to say. I, I feel like I'm diffusing a bomb, or maybe setting a bomb. <laughs> uh, and this doesn't, you know, to do that, there, you have to know certain things. Uh, and you have to feel that you know the culture that you're in, that you know the terrain that you're on. So, it, I mean, I, I feel that I've undertaken investigations, you know, when I started writing about the neuro novel, I didn't really know that much neurobiology. I read some neurobiology, I was, uh, or some, you know, some popular books that were, you know, that I, I essentially wanted to get myself up to not quite the level of Ian McEwan, who, who really has studied this stuff. But uh, you know, it has uh, 
although it would, but to the level of somebody who reads his books as a popularly educated uh, understander of neurobiology. Uh, do I now consider myself an expert in neuroscience? Not at all. Uh, but I feel I felt like I did at a certain point reach enough uh, knowledge where I could where I could see where the neuroscientists themselves felt that they didn't know enough to pronounce that we are all brain all the way down, and there are these areas where you know we, we there's just a little bit of space left for free will. Uh, it seemed like that, and, and that there there was an excellent philosophers and neuroscientists, like Jerry Foyer, I think so. Uh, but having, you know, would I then continue? Having done that, I then sort of, like, sloughed that off. <laughs> and, and went back to writing what, was, what is, in fact, a very, uh, a very American kind of personal genre. Uh, but I also think this is because, I think the reason that, that people write about themselves is because they don't know themselves. And, Sometimes you end up, uh, you know, one of the, the I mean, you, you said this yesterday, right, that, the, that people who speak for Iranians in this country are often those who don't even hear that they were either born here or they don't, they're not familiar with culture. It's very, yeah, it's very problematic, and I think it, it, there is, it poses questions as to integrity, really. When I was really, I was pushed very strenuously by various publishers to, to cast myself as an Iranian exile, uh, and I, I could very, I could see it, I had talked to many literary agents who said, oh my god, you know, you're Iranian, have you read Reading Only to Tehran? And I could see dollar signs in their eyes, and like in the cartoons, and it was terrifying. And it took one agent, and her name is Nicole Araji, to understand that, um, to really get it, to say no, you know, this is, this is not, this is, we're not going to do this, there's no integrity in that. And, and it was, and, and it was a very, very difficult path, and because the pressures of the marketing machine are, are intense, and on the one hand, you're dealing with facing 30 rejections and uh, nobody getting what you're trying to do. On the other hand, you're, you're looking at you know deals that could be for half a million dollars and landing on CNN talking about things. And it's weird because of course you're an expert to, to a degree more than anybody else in the culture because you've grown up speaking a language, you know more about Iran in my case than 98% of people out there um, and so on. And yet I've always felt that these opinions were not interesting for the general public. They're very private opinions because I don't have an education in Iranian studies. I don't I haven't I haven't devoted ten years, fifteen years of my life the way I've devoted to literature into really understanding these things. So it's odd because on, on the one hand, even when you're you want to, you want to share, but you have to and there's so much there's so much pressure because it's so much easier really if you just go the way that the system uh, expects you to go. And and yet I think the rewards of integrity are far greater. And in the end, of course you do, you wind up writing about yourself. But in a way, I remember having a wonderful conversation in Paris a few months ago with a, with a novelist who said, uh, I'm, you know, with your next book, my, my next book is going to be a novel, she said, it has to be autobiographical, but in the most, it has, it's just an autobiographical gesture in the most imaginative sense. It is not at all literal. One talks about oneself in the most, you know, insidious, uh, devious uh, ways, but, but, but not as literal as the culture demands it. And in the end, that sense of literalness, I feel, really lacks uh, g genuine, uh, genuine nature. I, I just want to turn the discussion a little to two things, and then I'll open it to questions, because I know some of you have questions. I, both of you talked uh, in your remarks about the, um, writing criticism, and you contrasted it, Marco, I think, to two different ways of um, writing. One is scholarship, and the other is, I think you had a slightly um, different way of um, putting this, but of reviews. And, um, <laughs> and so I wonder about that, about um, your sense of the future of criticism. When I hear people talk about the future of criticism, I find often they're talking about the future of reviews not the future of criticism. And I wonder about your own feelings about that. Um, both of you, yeah. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the, I mean, there, a few years ago, there was this movie at the National Book Critic Circle Association, where 
they were very concerned that there were all these book reviews that were closing down. Uh, there seemed to be this, you know, the death of the book review. Uh, and what this, this was a kind of professional concern, in which you know, what this meant is that there were fewer opportunities for young writers to pick up an extra few bucks you know, writing book reviews. Uh, but as, as Keith wrote in his great essay uh, in which issue? Six? Four. Is four? Wow. Uh, um, I, where he, uh, he asked, why, you know, why do people want to write book reviews? Uh, when you, there are these great, you know, if you read Orwell on his book review writing habits, you know, he was, he was a hack, you know, he, he was a hack journalist and hated himself for being a hack journalist and did it to pay the rent, which you could, you know, which you could barely do in those days, uh, but you could do it. Uh, Cyril Connolly, uh, similarly self-hating about writing book reviews. I think anybody who has written, book, you know, the kind of uh, book review, short form book review that, you know, uh, with the constraints of plot summary and, and very limited word counts feels that this form is kind of limiting to thought. And yet, you know, what seemed to be coming after them was, you know, was the Amazon review, right? So if this is, you know, but this battle is ultimately, I think, not, I mean, if, if what one is battling for is more criticism, then what one needs is more longer form journals, and you have to be willing to give more space to people, which the internet, I mean, that's, that's one of the good things about the internet, because, you know, you're not, you're not using page, you know, you're not printing page costs, but yet somehow word counts have shrunk on the internet. Um, and I, and we, do we know why word counts shrink? Maybe probably because people can't read, you know, they, they, they don't like reading big scrolls. But there's no inherent, you know, you can force people, we, we, we like to force people on our website, but before we get our website redesigned, we like to force people to read an enormous scroll. Um, <laughs> and, you know, some, some people did, but, and we weren't particularly, you know, we, we weren't cruel with word counts. Uh, we gave people enough space to express themselves, and if they started to go on like I'm doing, we would cut them off. <laughs> <laughs> and Lena? Uh, I, I lost track of the question. What's the question? Oh, I, I, I got involved in scrolls and in plus one. <laughs> uh, criticism versus book reviews, I think. Was the, oh, uh, was yeah. The yeah, I'm not. I've never been crazy about book reviews, actually, and I, I think criticism is probably a very broad category, and and I and I hope uh, very much that criticism also includes more imaginative form of criticism. Uh, it's not just criticism; it just sounds um, in and of itself. It sounds a bit a bit dull, uh, and and I, I whereas I think that the exercise is is manifold. Is that the correct pronunciation? I learned a few words from you tonight. <laughs> Sloth. I didn't know how to pronounce. Oh, that's, that's, that's um, good English. For and and <laughs> and so so yeah, it's more exciting. I I've always found book reviews uh, difficult uh, to 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 write and and a bit. We were also talking about this yesterday. It's very difficult when you're a young critic to be given the books of other young writers and to be forced to say negative things about them. It's very difficult, and I always did it. And I actually I I tried to always avoid it because whenever I was faced with that I had the feeling that I was I was tearing apart you know ten three five five years of work and possibly the career of a young writer so I preferred to do interviews I did a lot of interviews in the years that I was working as a journalist and and I think that's also another category the interview another form of criticism uh, and um, and, and an interesting one as well, uh, but uh, but I, I like in, in, at this time I like to think that criticism also involves uh, more creative forms. And what in America is not very clear to me what they mean by creative nonfiction. It seems like a bit of a hippie. Yeah, well, that, yes, that is. Uh, I actually was was hired to teach creative nonfiction. What is it? Once. What it's, is it? Well, it's it's it's, the, it's a negative category. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's it's in search of itself. You know, but it could, it, it, would, it might include what the French call autofiction, which I know is a form that you don't like, uh, at least as it's practiced. Um, you could include uh, the fact-based long-form essay, uh, you could include uh, memoirs of various, I, mean, I guess you could also say, you know, would pastiche count as creative nonfiction as a review? 
and very, it, it seems like it would be very hard. I mean, it might, and as a teaching exercise, this might be a fun thing to do is to, you know, you know, to get people actually to write pastiche, which is not a form that people really seem to practice very much here. And you, know, you can imagine, you know, every now and then, like Mishko Pavitani would do a pastiche review, and he would sort of be like, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> actually, didn't she do that for Ben? Did she do that for Ben's book? Yes. Yes. Which book? For uh, for Ben Kunkel's novel, there was a there was, a, there was a attempted pastiche, and then but then you, of course if you know the novel, you know how much you know you can, you can see the difference. Uh, and in some ways, pastiche really only works. You you know the reader has to have read the book, and so part of the problem is like what is the the service? You know there, there's this kind of what is a reviewer doing? Is a reviewer providing a service? You know is like in which case that makes them sound like they're working at McDonald's. Uh, or are they, you know, is there a service to culture? But then we've, we've, we've fragmented culture so much that everyone has their niche. So you can only just say this book belongs in this niche. And in that way, so in that case, the reviewer is more like a traffic cop, right? Mm -hmm. like, you go to that niche, you go to that niche. So what we would need, you know, it seems like the only way to, I, I don't know, I don't know if I, if I would be comfortable with the New York Times, like, return to, Becoming the guardian of Philistine middle culture, right? It's like yeah, this book is everybody should read this book. Nobody should read this book. Uh, so, it's, so you know, but I've learned, because my own first book was published recently. I've also seen the other side of it, and I've been utterly fascinated. Not just you know, of course, many all readers read differently into a book, but the terrifying news is that people read differently into a review. Now you could have the most positive review, and then people will write, "I'm so sorry, this really, you know, I, she was a bit nasty, etc." And then you've had, I, I just had my editor in England say, "Oh, I'm, I was very pleased. This was a positive piece, and I read it. I was horrified." And it, it's really, that's quite extraordinary to see that you know even with small texts we are again a free readers and and free to, to weave and unweave um, the small text of criticism in whichever ways that we can or, or want or try in a, in any given day. But I, I love the the sort of tableau you made of all the possible kinds of, of creative nonfiction because I think we ought to think of criticism as as definitely a more creative form and also a form of art. And if we could have more variation and more fun with it, I think the culture would be all the richer for it. And it's something that Noreen mentioned yesterday. She said she was very tired of seeing in newspapers um, women who were, or men who were asked to review books that seemed to belong to their own specialties. And it's true, that too is a bit odd, that why would a book on Iran just be given to an Iranian? Or you know, somebody who's lost a child would write about a book with about a lost child and so on and so forth. And that too, there needs to be a bit more bold, you know, we need to be brash and a bit more more creative and, and also bold. And um, and, and I and, and I'm actually I'm I'm the eternal optimist. I think, you know, you look at you, you you created N plus one, it's true. Uh, new things are being created all the time and, and I think there is really room. And and I, I believe it very firmly, we will continue this. We will continue writing books, we will continue writing about books and there will be readers. And in fact, if you think about it, never in history has there been so many people in so many libraries in the world and bookstores in the world buying books. In, I don't care what English. they buy. And in English. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what they buy. It doesn't matter. You know, so much of it. You, did, did many people read in the 15th century? You know, did that many people read in the 19th century? No. So can we stop with this like sense of impending doom on the literary culture? I, I don't understand. <laughs> I really don't. You're very, you're, also, you're very brave to read your book reviews. I, wanna, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I can read my, my book reviews. I don't believe writer, a lot of writers pretend, the book off pretended he didn't read the book reviews. I don't, I don't believe them for a second. And, and the, the novelists who try in the beginning to tell me, oh, you know, I, 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 I sent them a few things, my friends, and I said, oh, look at this, and look at that, and this is traumatizing, and this made me happy, and they said, oh, we never read them, etc. Slowly the truth came out, you know, and, and they would give you anecdotes about the first horrible review they read, and how they ran into the reviewer in a pub in Ireland, and so forth. I don't believe any of them. Of course, they, of course they all read the rules. It's hard not to, it's hard not to live. Yeah, I, well, I have the, the microphone for the record. One, one more thing I want to say about genres of, of criticism, which was that uh, I, I also like to think of, when I've when I reviewed books, I like to think of there being a story of the of the book. And yeah, this means breaking every rule that you were taught in literary theory, you know, that you have to be able to speculate about intention, 
uh, even if it's unconscious intention on the part of the author, uh, because you then end up with either you know a sort of tragedy or comedy of the book that you're reviewing, and or you know it can be history. So there, there's a way in which it seems that there that one can conceive it exactly as an you know that you're writing a story, uh, and uh, you know to me like the reviews that I enjoy reading. They, their reviews or their their worst criticism that, that that are able to either they tell a story about the culture or they at large or they tell you a story about how this particular form of book came into existence or the story. I or, agree completely. You know, and, that's, and that seems that seems like the important thing for me. Uh, you know, and as an editor, I would tell that to people who are you know, writing for mm -hmm. for us. And I think the best pieces of criticism, the ones I enjoy most, really read like little pieces of fiction. They read like little inventions, you know, stories about, in their own right. And they can be three pages, but they're they're moving, they're fun, they're great, they're intelligent, they're creative, and they they really there is no there is no in, in that way I guess I'm very un-American. I don't see that that I don't see uh, very much difference between fiction and non-fiction. I think most non-fiction is fiction, and I think even when we pretend to be journalists, we're making up facts all the time. It was fascinating to me when I was working. I did two pieces for the Paris Review, and um, two very very long interviews, and the Paris Review have very very very, very precise fact checkers. And every time they were trying to, actually, you know, this also happened with a New York Times piece. Every time they were so precise that they were trying to fix facts, I could see a new error being introduced by the fact checker himself. And it was a non ending thing. And I thought, wow, there's this, there's this idea that truth just, you know, is, is something that's stable and rigid and, and has a life of its own. And of course, that's not the case at all. And I was always, I was always conscious that I, I, I always felt like an imposter as a journalist because I felt I was making things up. I was very conscious that I that I was. I think we can open it to a couple questions from the floor. I think we have time for a couple questions. And then we have some very nice bottles of wine in the back and some books that um, to sell and to be signed. And um, we can celebrate. Are there any questions from the floor? Yes. Oh, this is a wonderful, fabulous evening, very nourishing. Uh, and the space that we're in, too, I feel like you know, keeping alive the thing of literature here. Um, I taught English for 10 years, CUNY and Rutgers and Rutgers State. So I, I feel a little sense of the apathy of young people out there, the culture, you know, to literature. Um, and I also, I think the education system is quite a good job. And again, it's a social class, too. So you know, the class the elites so have always gotten the tend to get a better education. I want to mention a philosopher named John Dewey. And here are very few people mentioned in the critics, but he's, I'm reading uh, Art as Experience. And Dewey says some really interesting things about critics. His critics are very important because the more you know, the more you know, the more you see the work of art, the more you feel, the more you experience. And knowledge is very important. But also, Dewey talks about the importance of the encounter uh -huh. and what you bring to it. So I want to know what your thoughts are about that, about personal response and, and um, you know, how, how that transaction between the person and the text. You don't hear that much of that talk today in the literary circles. Mm -hmm. Have they forgotten John Dewey? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there are a couple of questions embedded in that. Yeah. Uh, do you want to take a first shot, Martha? Uh, but I think it's, the question of encounter is really an interesting one, and I think you're seeing now more these kind of books like Elif Batuman's book that, that possessed uh, Mechanism in Russian Literature, which, which is basically about, which, which tries to put in all the things that, uh, that, one, that one usually did not talk about. And, and the opening of Lilo's book is like this, where you know, it's, the, it's, these, it's the moments of reading that, that were relegated previously to the margins, this sort of, uh, the feel of the, the rustle of the page, the sense of what it's of even the first sentence that you read. So this kind of slowing down is it really, you know, and at this point, it seems like from a social class perspective, you know, we might as well throw this notion of high culture elite out the window because it's not like, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've taught at Ivy League schools where there have been excellent students and there have been students who couldn't care less about reading. And so if we just slow, 
down, you know, if, if one is to actually go, this is a book, who care, you know, a, this, this, this sort of, not to be able to seduce people into high culture, but just to, to get rid of the, uh, the stigma of elitism that's attached to high culture, that would be, that would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely, and uh, yeah, no, nothing to add. Do we have another question? <laughs> Sorry, there you talk about hiding. You talk about hiding. Any other questions? No more. Yes. I was just interested in um, when you said earlier that, that uh, sometimes instead of writing criticism, you prefer to do an interview. Bit, yes, well, it depends on what kind of interview it is, but I think an interview can be a critical interview. For instance, the Parish Review interviews are a very unique format where you st you sit for eight hours with the writer, and you're trying you've read you've tried to read a lot of their work, and uh, and you try to make sense with them of the coherence of their work and their journey, their intellectual journey. Now that's as critical as you know anything I know. And there's also a lot of uh, what people don't really know. And again, it's an amusing thing about American culture. So the Paris Review, which is again, you know, supposed to be the paragon of the, the, the it's an uber interview, and you think that it's just mathematically, factually accurate. I felt I was writing theater because what, for instance, what one of the authors who I'm not going to name said was just it was a lot of it was it was just so incredibly chaotic it was difficult to understand what he was talking about it took a lot of rewriting and of course then you send it to the writers and they never they, most of them 99% of them really believe that they've said it exactly the way you said it but you're always rephrasing <laughs> and uh, and of all the writers I've interviewed I've interviewed very many in the last nine years just one just one realized that I had rewritten it one and said thank you uh, for making me sound smarter which was so kind of him uh, but all the others are persuaded that they've spoken that way, but really it's you, first of all, you give them particular angles. Uh, I interviewed Umberto Eco for nine hours in Milan, and trust, you know, really, interviewing Umberto Eco was the most fastidious, difficult thing I've done, and, and just trying to lend some coherence and shape to his vast body of work and his humongous ego with <laughs> many, um, you know, direct encounter with man and text, you know, uh, flesh, flesh in more ways than one. Uh, so, so, and, and then there's a the whole rewriting, and then there's a the shower of insults because he was very insulted that we found factual errors. And he said, "You and your damn editors, you think you know my life better than I do." And, and the whole thing was hilarious. Wow. <laughs> so, so yes, it, it was it was a work. It was you know it was also critical work and critical thinking, critically rewriting, uh, critically approaching. And I and I wound up getting my revenge as a, as a critic by writing an introduction that was a little unorthodox and uh, and talking about you know what a narcissist and an egomaniac he was and you sent him the introduction in fake Latin so that he wouldn't grumble about it and, um, and so so yeah there's a lot it's never what I think what I think I mean is is that also criticism is never uh, it, it's always a way of looking at the other and looking at the world that's not completely direct you're always coming at angles you're always working, shaping. I just learned a new word recently. I'm always learning new words like all my friends know in the English language. I love the English language. And I learned the word beveld. And beveld means apparently to sl sloping, something that's sloping and you, you re-angle it. Or, right? you, it's an angle or you make it sloping. And, and there's that... Beveled. Sorry? Beveled. Thank you. See? <laughs> There's nothing. There's nothing more lovely for me than being taught new words and bevel. Thank you. God, I read. I read that word 22 times without seeing it wrong. There's no accentuation in English. So you're, you're not uh, going to get any help. So exactly. So and and and, and the, I I think I think beveled is a beautiful image for what the critic is doing. You know, with the world and the text and the person in front of them. Thank you very much, Mila. Thank you, Marco. Please join us. In